I'm Keith McCullough and welcome back. This is the fifth one. If you've stayed with me five for five or on day two, I sincerely appreciate that. Uh, this one's going to be a beauty because I get to get coached, or at least I think Ryan Renteria has some thoughts on coaching. Uh, Ryan, welcome. It's, it's been a long time since you and I have seen each other in person, but we've, we've known each other for a long time. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Keith. Uh, I just, I've got a lot of respect for the positive impact that you're having in the, in the post-hedge fund days and real excited to, to dig in and help the audience however I can in terms of reducing stress without sacrificing performance. And hopefully people will see the lessons are relevant, whether you're running a large fund or leading a team of two. I love that. Uh, his book, by the way, is called Lead Without Burnout. So uh, watch for that in early looks uh, coming to a theater near you, because I'll be quoting uh, Renteria multiple times. I, I, I just want to take a step back, though, first, and just kind of give people a sense of where you came from, because you really have had a transformative career. Uh, again, we met on Wall Street. We didn't meet writing books. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, happy to dig into that. I was raised by a single mom on a kindergarten teacher's salary in Sacramento. I went to a very violent public high school with a very high dropout rate, and I was the first guy in a long time to get into Stanford. And I really nearly had to drop out because I was so woefully unprepared. I didn't go to the, the fancier schools that others had. And, but I did survive and use that grit to push through, and I made it to Wall Street, and that's where we met. And I spent about a decade there, uh, first at Goldman, in equity research, and then I was at two hedge funds, Bally Asney and Karsh. And I was very fortunate to have good numbers and achieve financial independence right as I was burning out. And I decided to completely walk away. And I feel like that decision has some important lessons for everyone. It was an amazing one for me because I've been blessed to have led a pretty good life since then. I've volunteered with several children's charities right after that. I, I spent nine years as a Moneyball advisor to the Indiana Pacers, their coaching staff, their GMs, and now I've built this executive coaching business for CEOs and managing partners and senior investors. But there were also some flaws in that decision process, though I don't regret it and it was the right one for me. I thought staying in that business would completely destroy my personal life, and I was wrong. Hmm. 15 years ago, I just didn't have the lessons in work-life balance and leadership and things of that nature that I have today, and that's really what the focus of my coaching work is, and as well as the book that I've written, where I'm donating all the profits to mental health charities. Love that. Uh, mental health, big uh, big topic locally, as, as I'm sure uh, you've heard. There's a, an organization called Shoulder Check, uh, where hockey, it's a hockey, have you heard of, have you heard of that, uh, Shoulder Check by chance? Sh I have not heard of Shoulder Check. It's, it's a, you know, so around, what you'll see in New England prep school hockey now, is if it's a if it's a game where they're they're acknowledging uh, shoulder check the foundation it's a mental health foundation, all the hockey guys get around in a circle which is atypical before a game especially with the other team and puts <laughs> you know put their arms around each other and the whole point is check in you know check in right. with your neighbor with your teammate because you never know um, right. we can get into that too I I want to take a step back obviously we will get into that obviously but I want to take a step back and just you know. Your point on, you know, by the way, there's a, there's a reason why Renteria looks a lot better than I do right now. Like, there's a reason why his <laughs> hair isn't white. Um, it's a grind, man. Um, it, it is a real grind. Uh, Karsh Capital, by the way, was, was literally the first revenue check that ever came into Hedgeye. It's a, it's, it's a thing. We it. have it. Uh, and McGough is still there. Yeah. <laughs> it's still, it's, all that happened. But, man, can you, can, can you kind of lift off where you were there and say, because you did interject that it isn't what you thought it, it was. You think that you could have survived it now that you know what you know. But l tell people what that job felt like when you were burnt out. Yeah, I mean, to, to be honest with you, all aspects of my personal life were in the toilet. I was sleeping horrendously. Sometimes I'm covering international stocks and I'm setting my alarm for midnight and I wake up. And if the news is good and favorable to my position, then I can't get back to bed. I'm so excited. I want to see where the stock opens. And if it's bad news, I'm thinking, <coughs> man, I'm about to have a horrendous day and it's midnight and I haven't gotten any sleep. Yeah. So uh, the sleep is terrible. I, I really felt like I had no time to exercise. I remember my first year at Goldman Sachs, you had to use the gym once in order to keep with that. I think you had like a nine month wait list to, to, to get to the gym. So we would go swipe our card, turn around and go right back to work just to keep our membership, which we never used. So 
exercise was, was very <laughs> difficult. You're eating at your desk. You're not exactly ordering the healthiest things on earth. And I mean, forget about being present at home with loved ones. You're your stocks are always on your mind. So it is a complete and utter grind. It is a brutal business. And I guess at that time I felt like, well, this is how it's always gonna be. I have to walk away. And once again, I'm, I feel very blessed. It was a great decision for me. Life's been phenomenal. But I could have stayed in that business had I realized the things that I realized today. And I'm, and I'm happy to get into sort of those things, but a lot of it has to do with the culture you create with your team, how you outsource, how you trust, the A players you bring in, et cetera. Well, you mentioned uh, you mentioned family. Now that certainly uh, you know resonates with me now, and it it will resonate with the younger teammates that I have that are uh, either just having their first child or about to. Uh, it is it is quite an experience to try to do this job and try to be even an average at best parent. I mean, right. uh, if you if people think I'm bad at trying to coach how to play this game, you should you, you should try to tune in to me on parenting. Oh my oh, oh my, <laughs> that would be bad, really bad. Um, but it, correct me if I'm wrong, but in your book, you really have these three, you're like freedom, family time, and your health. Like those are three big things, uh, that you should be focusing on, not one at a time, but together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it's really about, um, achieving a 10 out of 10 as a whole human. And so we have a, uh, an exercise in the book called the Wheel of Life that's I just tweaked. Uh, it was originally designed by, I think, your alma mater, uh, somebody out of your alma mater many years ago. But what the problem is, is that most of us are perfectionists and we're trying to be a 10 out of 10 in every single area of life. Mm -hmm. And that is impossible. It's just a recipe for burnout. And so what happens is people naturally think, well, I'm going to default to work because I don't want to let my team down. I don't want to slip behind the competition. And so everything else suffers. And I truly believe that self-actualization comes from, can I be an eight or nine out of 10 in the three or four areas of life that matter the most to me? Mm -hmm. And that's really what a lot of my focus in the book is and a lot of my focus with coaching is. And I can tell you that the majority of CEOs that I coach are anywhere between 45 and 60. And it's a common theme over and over again I wish I had more time with my kids when I do. It's phenomenal. I want to be more present with them. I'm never going to get this time back. And so how do I realize that without slipping versus the competition, letting my team down and sacrificing my professional goals? And that's what the book and the coaching is all about. Mm -hmm. When you, uh, you know, I guess there, there, there will be atypical experiences you have with, with an executive and then there's <laughs> kind of the typical, I guess, response, but what is it like when you when you 45 to say that's right squarely uh, in my you know in my wheelhouse I'm 49 uh, I, I've seen a lot if I I don't I, I actually don't ask for a lot of help on this because I, I wouldn't know who to ask so I guess that's the point are you are you kind of like their shrink <laughs> you're, you're getting to one of the most important points is that CEOs it's, it's extraordinarily lonely at the top you feel like you don't um, your therapist might not have the business experience to understand your significant other may or may not, but you don't want your marriage to be entirely talking about your work. And you may fear looking weak in front of your investors, your board or your team. And so this is why executive coaching is exploding because there are very few trusted sounding boards out there that you can open up, be vulnerable, talk through these things and get evidence-based counsel on how to improve some of these things. The, um, I mean, I'm part of a, I shouldn't say I have no access. I mean, I'm part of, you're familiar with YPO, I assume? Of course, yes. So y, YPO, Young Presidents Organization, you have to be actually under the age of 50, which now I'm knocking on the door, so maybe they're gonna kick me out. But um, the, you know, what they, what's super helpful there is what they call a forum, where you have, so I'm in a group with eight other founders, executives of their companies, and they, those companies have nothing to do with each other. They do that purposefully, so we're not just talking stocks in the, in the meetings. But it's really like, it's, it's purely confidential. You can open up, you, you get to hear. And again, we hit on these big topics, your relationship with your That's spouse, right. your, your relationship with your children, your relationship with your business, how do you make it come together? Um, that, that's been part of my solution. Uh, I've never, and many people, Brace, bracing for it right now would say, I've been telling, a lot of people would say that I need a therapist, right? 
<laughs> but I've never had one for anything, you know, other than a physical therapist, I guess I've had that. Uh, but, I, but how do you get around people? Like, how do you, how do you get, how do you get to somebody like me? Who's like probably a little stubborn on that level. Sure. Well, you're a lifelong learner, right? So you're always trying to improve yourself and you see it in the investing game. And it's really about helping the individual understand that nothing could be more important than improving from a leadership game, because that's actually going to take your EBITDA, your returns on capital higher. You're going to have more family time. You're going to be more relaxed, et cetera. And it's interesting that you brought up this, this uh, forum because I, I lived in New York City for 17 years. And when I moved my family back to my hometown of Sacramento six years ago, we were supposed to get an MLS team um, and I was going to be one of the local owners. And at the breakfast, I met somebody who was one of the top businessmen in town. And he said, I recently started a forum. It's very much like YPO EO, but we're independent. We're not affiliated with them of 12 prominent CEOs in town and we need a professional coach. And so I started working with them in, in that type of format that you're used to from YPO. And then over time, people felt like it was a phenomenal outlet, but they wanted more time than once a month. And then a number of them said, can you work with me one on one? And so uh, that forum is phenomenal. I have a lot of experience with it. I still do it today. And I think that, again, it comes back to understanding that if you get help from somebody outside of your circle, because you cannot see things when you're too deep in your own weeds, it's just going to make both your business life and your personal life dramatically better. Mm hmm. How do you, um, how do you, I, I don't think the word would be separate, so, so let me ask this differently. Like, how do you go from fixing or helping Keith, the CEO, to helping him help his culture and creating what I think you call it a culture of well-being? And do you do mm -hmm. it all at the same time or do you separate the personal versus the strategies? The, the second drives the first. And so it all starts with, how do you create a culture of well-being that attracts the most elite A players out there okay. that then you learn to trust and delegate to with autonomy and ownership of responsibilities, which frees up more of your time for two things. Number one, deep strategic thinking about where you want to take your business on a five to 10 year basis. What is the changes in technology and customer preferences, what geographies or markets might I wanna to go to? What do I need to do to take my EBITDA, my returns on capital higher on a five to 10 year basis? And number two, mental recharging and that time with family and friends and at the gym and eating properly. It's funny because people thought, oh, Lead Without Burnout is the title of your book. You're gonna talk all about sleep and exercise and meditation. <laughs> Well, everyone already knows that you need those things. It's how do you create the time for those things? Yes. And that's really what the book is about. It's about creating that culture that gets the elite A players in there and fired up and want to fight the world for you. And you're still in the trenches with them. You're still working hard, but you're spending more of your time on strategy, big picture thinking and mentally refreshing yourself so that you're that best executive when you come in on a day to day basis. Yeah, the um, uh, on a uh, separating those two things, even though they go together, on a personal level, uh, I would say that the way I've solved par partly for that. When people say, "Man, you read a book every ten days, you write, you've written three thousand early looks. How the hell do you? How, how the hell? Why aren't you three hundred pounds? And you know, on the on the <laughs> eve of your first heart attack, and I might be, but I'm not three hundred pounds. And and, and it's because my wife and I have essentially agreed to agree on a certain you know, organization of our day and of our week and of our month with our kids and our schedules where mm -hmm. I actually have time as soon as the market closes to not deal with family stresses, business stresses. I actually, I, to just to call it plainly, it's my time with my dog, right? I used to run a lot with them. Now I can't run as much. So I run downhill and I walk up the hills, but you know, you take, we take a, that, that time is critical for me in the day, right? Cause I have 12 right. hours that I'm grinding from, That's right. 4.30 to 4.30, and then it's me and a, you know, I love, I love Boomer, but the, he's not going to talk back. He's not going to ask me questions. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so, so, but I, I think if my wife and I didn't agree to agree on that, like if I had a wife who's like, look, kids just got home from school. Giddy up there, buddy. Uh, you know, you, you better be in it uh, like I am right. on the weekends. And, but right. I can't. I, 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 think that that would I think that would take me right up. Sure. 
Well, I think uh, it's a great point. Cheers to you for creating that time and to have a very supportive wife and to work together to figure out what that right time is. For some people, it's the middle of the day where after a certain amount of time, they feel burnt out, they need a refresh on productivity, and they may take an hour walk in nature. And first time you propose something like this, they think, are you crazy? But that's when you're getting some of your best deep strategic thinking time done because you're not in the office and you're not getting hit with a bunch of emails and people walking in your office. For somebody like yourself, it's bolted to the, to the chair with the market hours, then post-market hours is the right time to do it. And so each person based on their specific uh, business that they're in has to work out when they do that time, but creating that time and being present during that time is the most important thing. Coming home, and seeing your kids and checking your phone every five minutes is not being present. And they recognize that. Mm -hmm. the, um, now, now, creating that for your team, like, you know, like uh, Marina's on the board, Genron's on the switch, like our, our, they have to be here because we're on live TV today. They can't go for sure. a walk right now, right? That's uh, right. It, but, like, we don't have written rules here where, well, first of all, we have no, uh, no vacation policy, like you take your vacations when you need them. Uh, you can leave the office whenever you want, want to go for a walk, and a lot of people do. Um, mm -hmm. Is that, like, we're a very unique culture, I get that. Uh, we're very flexible, and we love finding, uh, to your, to, in your definition, A players. Uh, and they get that, but, you know, how, how atypical is that in, in, in your findings, like, with all the people that you work with? Yeah, it completely depends on the business, right? So I work with uh, one CEO is a manufacturing business. Another one has uh, distributes uh, residential construction. And, and so those frontline jobs, you yep. have to be there on the front line, right? Yep. Whereas maybe you have other roles that are more IT, IT driven or tech driven that have some more flexibility and, and things of that nature. But I think the beautiful thing that's happening is over time, people realize there is a massive shortage of A player talent. And if you are going to beat your competition for that talent, particularly in a, in a remote world where people aren't necessarily tied to certain cities, then you have to really figure out what is most important to that one individual that I'm currently interviewing to fulfill this role. Yeah. And everyone has different levels of things that are important to them. And so understanding that is key to winning over that talent and beating your competition. And again, it's gonna vary by the business and by the specific hour of the day. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit more about those A players? Like, I mean, you can use whatever example obviously you want. I mean, you worked with the, Indian, uh, with the, with the, with the Pacers, I mean, at that level, uh, or at my level, like the analog would be, I have X amount of analysts. Uh, there are A players and there are players that wanna be A players. There are players that could be mm -hmm. A players. There are players that never mm -hmm. will become A players. They tried, they failed, et cetera. Um, can, you, can you walk through how you would define uh, both what an A player becomes and, and or what you're looking for for that to happen? Sure. And, and again, I think it varies by the role, but a lot of it comes, and integrity and ethics is table stakes. Let's just get that out of the way. You never want a culture killer, no matter what. Um, but I think there are a few killer. characteristics. You just wave that <laughs> off. Like that's the first thing that gets you at, out, out of here uh, is, is yeah. if you're like that person. Uh, and it's yeah, so it's bloody it's obvious. Sticks. It's like a yeah, black exactly. swan floating around the floor out here. <laughs> <laughs> it's not worth it. Whether you're in the NBA or on Wall Street or, or running a manufacturing, it's just not worth it, right? To have, to have somebody like that. So I think, you know, the whole premise of the book is being able to hire the A players that are lifelong learners. They crave autonomy, responsibility, ownership, and you want to be able to trust that you can delegate high level responsibilities to them and you don't have to continuously check in on them and they can run with the first 90 percent and it's on them to take good notes to be detail oriented to be organized and to stay on top of things and know when to bring you in for the final 10 percent for you to see how their thought process is evolving etc so i think you know organization attention to detail lifelong learner intellectual curiosity somebody that's extraordinary, extraordinarily reliable. Those are all sort of core traits, no matter what the, the, the business that you're in. And then obviously there's gonna be role specific traits. And I think a lot of it comes down to what people need to ask themselves is there are some people here that may be world-class investors. Are you world-class as a hirer? 
And every aspect of that process is so important from the first impression you make, whether it's a written job description, or if you never write a job description and you're just asking contacts for references, having that unique selling proposition, because make no mistake, you are selling them on joining you. If they truly are an A player, they have a lot of choices and you're selling them on joining you. And then it's the unique interview questions and to make sure that it's just not, oh, this person had a great day and one person liked them. Do you have a quantitative system for rating them where these are the five things we're looking for and they interviewed with five people and we put these weights and we have some sort of scientific process behind it. And then the reference checks, are you just calling the two people that are on their list or are you digging deeper and trying to find contacts in the industry that may know the real story to make sure that you're making the right hire because turnover is extraordinarily expensive. So I, I wrote all about this in HBR, Fast Company. Those articles are on my website if, if, if people want to see more about that process. Yeah, that, that, it's, that's a critical one. I mean, the hiring process, we put a lot of time and effort into it. Um, uh, yeah, actually, uh, you mentioned McGough, uh, Regina McGough, uh, who is not the Brian McGough. She, she runs that process for us. And, yep. and suffice to say, was, she, first of all, she's a longstanding pro uh, in that field, but that makes a huge difference, man. Huge like, difference. Yeah, you know, if, you, if you know what we're looking for, and you have, like you said, a system, like if, if, we, if we don't have anything, we have process, right? Uh, we have a process to identify what we're looking for, and then, for me at least, I think the most critical thing is to do the final interview. I mean, mm -hmm. we have just inside of 100 employees. I do every mm -hmm. single final interview because mm -hmm. at least, and I'd love to get your feedback on this, the way that I've thought about this business is like a family, right? I have yep. my, my family and firm, my family is my family, my firm is my family. And it's, I, I think that if we have a bad hire, I have to accept responsibility at some, you know, at some rate right at the top level for yep. missing that in the interview, but not just missing it in the interview, but the, designing the process to have the interview, right? Because it right. should have become obvious throughout the process. Um, That's right. So what do you think about that? I absolutely love that. I mean, I, I have some CEOs that have a thousand, 2000 employees that are trying to do all the interviews and I'm wow. talking them out of that from a scale perspective. Yeah. It, it's just hard to scale that way, but I absolutely love that you do the the final interview. Um, and I, I think it's absolutely critical because all it takes is one bad hire to, to really drive a wedge throughout the organization. And you may not find out about it until it's too late because it may seem like, oh, everything's fine. And then you find out four months later when two other people decide to walk out the door, that person was a huge problem. And they the other person didn't feel comfortable coming to you and, and things of that nature. So I'm, I'm fully on board with with you executing the final interview for all those hires, and I hope you still do that when you're at 200 to 300 people. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll try. Uh, no, in fact, I have to try. I have to make time. You got to make time in your schedule. You got to empower somebody to do something. I always think about it that way. Teach people to do what you do, so you could do something else, right? I mean, That's exactly so that right. that um, is one way to find the time. But if you don't want to make the time, you're gonna have a shitty culture. You're gonna have shitty hires. Yeah. I mean, eventually, you're gonna yeah. have a lot of and actually, that is the history of the hedge fund business. I mean, look at the turnover. I mean, a lot of people, to your point, are well-known investors, but aren't well-known hirers. I mean, right. culture fits. I mean, we have, you know, I think it would be an understatement to call analyst seats in the hedge fund community, you know, it's a generalization, which I don't always like to make, but you know, there's a revolving door in a lot of places. Of course. So, yeah, um, and I, th I, th I think part of that is, uh, a hiring issue. And part of that is also flaws in leadership. I think that there are a number of people that feel like, well, I need to bark and yell and scream and be all over my people or and, and the fear is going to motivate them. And it actually does the opposite because people feel like, well, you know, if this guy's going to act this way, as soon as I get my numbers up, I'm going to find a better deal or I'm, I'm going to walk out the door. And if you feel like you need to scream and yell and bark at people to motivate them, then you have failed at hiring an A player because an mm -hmm. A player doesn't need that. What an A player needs is somebody who can really separate process versus outcome and understand, was this due to an unfavorable, unlucky outcome in which you need empathy? Man, I've been in your seat before. That happened to me. The best thing you could do is make like a goldfish and forget, like Ted Lasso says, and <laughs> how can I help you get there? And if it's a flaw in the process, it's not berating that person. It's figuring out 
you know what? I had mistakes in my process. I've gotten better over 25 years of doing it. How can I help you? Let's dig into where the mistake in the process happened, right? So that's part of it. And really also the recognition. People crave not just general thank yous and general attaboys, but specific compliments. Man, I really loved how you asked those three crucial questions of the management team that really helped us get a better understanding. And I feel like that's what allowed that to be a successful investment. And I hope you continue to do that in the future. People walk away from getting a comment like that completely fired up and loyal and wanting to go to war with a guy like that for the long term. So I think poor hiring is part of it and, and leadership's another part of it. Hmm. That's a, a really good point on process versus outcomes. I mean, I don't know if you've read it, but uh, Annie Duke wrote a book called Thinking in Bets. And yep, it's the best. <laughs> it's just called Resulting, right? And she's, of course, uh, you know, a card player. So when you're, when you're, you're, you play the hand that has the highest probability and you just accept the outcome. You don't anchor that's on right. it. I mean, I, that's right. I think that that's, um, you know, I think it's a highly underestimated competitive advantage uh, is yep. leaning on your process. And that's right. You can, like, if I think about my experience, like I've, I've hired a lot of people both, you know, on the hedge fund side as analysts and with my own fund and all that and 15 years of doing this, making the hair go white. But the, um, the it, it's happened where you give an A player uh, responsibility. I mean, it's it's defined in our in our culture and in our compensation mechanism. So you you can mm -hmm. make as much as you can. There's no cap. You know, you don't get mm -hmm. capped by what the what the firm made. It's generally speaking, right. if you're in particular a sector head or a you know somebody like Brian McGough or any of our our A players on the on the content side. Um, so that's not the problem, right? But I mean, I have seen problems develop when you see somebody. Uh, achieve an A player achieve A type results um, mm -hmm. monetarily, and it changes them. And that, mm -hmm. from a culture perspective, there's maybe nothing worse than that. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I think it's important to start off with empathy because I feel like I'm a good person, and I I had a a blowout year, and I got arrogant, and I thought, oh, yeah, I know how to do this game, and then the market just punches you in the face and humbles you. And so yeah. when you're younger and you've had some success, it's very easy to think, oh, I've, I've got this figured out. And so first empathizing and saying, yeah, I've, I've made some mistakes like that before and due to arrogance and things of that nature and, and I matured and here's how I'm gonna help you get there. And if that person gets there, then that's tremendous personal growth. If that person stays on the other side, then that's a, a culture problem. Mm -hmm. Big one. Another, an, another big problem that you write about in your book is you know, that's a culture problem for us. An A player can develop mental, you know, mental health issues that you're not aware of. Mm -hmm. Now that's tough, right? Especially in this day and age. Um, and especially when you're as tightly wound as me in terms of your daily schedule, right down to walking the dog, um, which is critical, critical time. <laughs> but the, right. how, how, do you, how do you talk to and, and coach people through that, that point? Well, the first thing I say to them is, what do Miley Cyrus, Emma Stone, Kevin Love, and Michael Phelps have in common? They're all rich, good looking, in great shape, world class at what they do, and they've all spoken out about mental health struggles. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are people at the absolute top of their game. And the stats show that one out of every two CEOs has mental health struggles, which is something like four times the average population. One out of, one out of two, did you say? one out of two right and anxiety counts in that anxiety okay. is one of the biggest ones right and so there's there's a continuum obviously and so i think that you have to be very aware as a leader and there are a few things that i look for number one does that person who's normally delivers you very high quality work very productive does it look like they're just caring less recently or their, their focus really isn't there right and then you can sort of ask some open-ended, non-judgmental questions to try to figure out, you know, if you can coach them and help them. Or number two, you might notice that somebody is speaking in a much snarkier tone or with shorter fuses or something of that nature, where they just, their joy doesn't seem to be there anymore. Their enthusiasm doesn't seem to be there anymore. Um, or number three, you might notice that, I mean, we're all tired in this business, right? But just a chronic, extended period of exhaustion. Those are some of the signs and there's no harm in just 
calling somebody into your office and checking in, I care about you, and just asking open-ended questions. Um, is there anything going on that I could help you with? I wanna be a sounding board. Are there any resources I could point you to? Because a lot of times it's too late. That person is then burnt out and decided I'm out. And so you need to recognize that early. Mm -hmm. Yeah, awareness is a social skill that does not find its, its way onto your SAT score. Um, the, the, that's actually, that, you, you know me, that's, that's my way of explaining why I didn't have the highest SAT score at Yale, okay? Because I, <laughs> I have other things I'm good at, right? But, I, but I, I, I think, I mean, leadership's not a given. I mean, leading a team to a championship uh, is a really hard thing to do. Uh, that's, it takes actual cultural buy-in. It doesn't take all the best A players. It takes the mm -hmm. players you have working together, does it not? I, I mean, having A players helps significantly. If, yeah. if you have B, B, B minus C players, then that's probably gonna be very hard to do. But yes, absolutely. It's, it's inspiring people around a vision of something bigger than themselves. And I'll tell you that most mission statements and most uh, values are terrible. They're just a bunch of fuzzy, vague buzzwords that mean nothing and nobody knows what they are and what they represent. And so actually the chapter in my book that's gotten the strongest feedback is probably the most unique is chapter two, the cultural bylaws. And I walk through how to design this document that's around the, why are we getting up every single day and doing this? What is it exactly that we're trying to do? How are we gonna get there? What are the mistakes that we've made and the lessons that we've learned so we can review before making decisions in the future, not make those same mistakes? And how do we rank our constituents? This kind of document and clarity allows you to talk to A players in the interview process about what we're all about and make them feel like you're joining something and becoming part of something bigger than yourself. And that's what people ultimately want. And it also makes it a lot easier for people, particularly in a, in a hybrid remote world where people are spread out to make decisions because they know quite clearly what is our what, our why, our how, and how are our constituents ranked. And so that's, that's one way to really get that culture all on the same page. Yeah, I mean, in cultural bylaws, you see a staggering 61% of employees don't know what their company's mission statement is. Um, I would be shocked. I'd have to maybe poke them a bit or lead them a bit, but. If I said, what are the words transparency, accountability, and trust at Hedgeye? What, what, where did that come from? Like that, mm -hmm. everything we do, everything we stand for, everything we produce has to, has to be based on those three words. So, mm -hmm. and, and for me, what I love about that, and I agree, I think that that chapter, um, that chapter really you know, resonated quite a bit and gave, gave me more ideas, but you started with a very good quote. Um, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll read it so people can get it. Yeah, cool. um, it and, and this is very well, very well researched books and, and some of the best books I've ever read uh, always have these quotes as a lead in because you're leaning on somebody else who's taught it a different way to say the same thing, right? And this quote is, people don't buy what you do, Keith. They buy why you do it. And why you do, and why you do simply proves what you believe. That mm -hmm. is, I mean, and that's by um, uh, Simon Sinek. Is he a is he an inspirational speaker or something? It's because it's very well put. Yeah, yeah. He he wrote a book called uh, I think it's called Starts with Why, and it's it was a game changer. It's phenomenal. Um, and yeah, I think I think that's really what it's all about. Is somebody walks into an interview room. Why, Keith, are you getting up every day and doing this? Why are you building and growing Hedgeye? What, what's the point, right? And, and if somebody really dug, in that, dug into that and understood more about you know, trying to separate yourself from the old wall and trying to help you know, s some of the folks that maybe aren't on Wall Street preserve their capital and create better memories with their family and more vacation time, that could be a hell of a selling point. Right, and when you have employees that are working hard in the grind, they're already part of your company, they're working hard in the grind, and they're feeling like, man, I'm, I'm just burnt out, I'm, I'm in a tough point right now, having that why to come back to. Well, th this is what Keith is inspiring us to do on a day-to-day -day basis. This is why we're getting up and doing this. I can't let my team down. Yes, I need to get some health and maybe take a little time away or, or see a coach or a therapist, but I, I wanna get myself well so I can keep rallying and helping this team 
with what's bigger than than me and what we're gearing for, and that's the why. And you, you, very well put, and, and uh, again, an excellent chapter in that in, in the book. Um, it could take a while, right? I mean, it could take because I at least would like to think uh, that I got the walk the walk part down, right? I may not be able to coach it perfectly every day. Like I always say, I often play the game better than I can coach it, but I'm working on that. But it could take a while for you to get your people to be the A players that are doing that. Because the goal for me isn't for them to be led just by me. That's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Like I want right. them to be led by Andrew Friedman, by every single person. You mentioned Brian McGough. Brian, we just went through a terrible... Um, a tragic event with the loss of one of our partners who, who I think you know, Todd Jordan. And McGough stepped up like from a leadership perspective in a mm -hmm. way that like that I couldn't have, I, I didn't go to his office and tell him to do that. But everything he did after that happened, and it was very difficult for us as a team, uh, was to me, and I said this to him, I said, look man, that, that, that took 15 years in the building for you to do that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and I'll tell you, one of my favorite quotes of all time, this came from um, one of the CEOs I work with in my, in my forum, and he's in his low 60s, empty nester, three kids out of the house, one of the best parents I've ever met. And he said, your kids listen to 10% of what you say, and they observe 100% of what you do. Mm -hmm. And I truly believe that that is equally true in leadership. So it starts with modeling the behavior that you want to see. And so, as you say, you walk the walk. McGough's seen that over 15 years of working with you. But then secondly, your job as CEO and as a leader is to coach your direct reports in all the principles that, like I cover in the book, of how to be a great leader. So it trickles down then throughout the organization. So then they're executing great leadership to their teams. They're coaching the people underneath them on how to be great leaders and so on. And so not only does that phenomenal leadership and culture trickle down throughout the organization, but it also makes secession planning a hell of a lot easier, not just to replace you when one day you decide to hang it up, but everyone on your team so that the junior analysts step up and become the senior analysts because internal hires are a lot less expensive and they're much better cultural fits and you want to promote with, from within. Yeah, it's... Uh... And I'm very happy that you, you tied that into to what the gentleman said about his kids, right? Because I think of it the same way. Interestingly, maybe not ironically, given that I'm on this, uh, with McGough and I have worked together for 15 years. We've known each other for as long as you and I and McGough knew each other because we're on yeah. different sides of uh, different, you know, diff we're on different teams. Uh, but my son, my firstborn son, he's 16 year old. I think uh, you might know his name's Jack. Um, I have four kids. It took the same amount of time, the same amount of time for, and it only happened, I think it was a couple weeks ago. I know it was a couple weeks ago. I get up, doing my thing, 4.30, 45 minutes later, like, yeah, I'm pretty in tune with, you know, with what's going on because nothing's going on other than me, you know, working. And uh, I hear this click, clack, click, clack, click, clack. And now that my son has his own, has his license, uh, so then he pops his head in the office uh, and said, what are you doing? He's like, I, I, have, a, I have a workout at 6 o'clock at Stanford Twin Rings. And I'm like, really? I said, who's scheduled that? Who's, who, I, I was more thinking who's paying for that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, um, and he's like, I did. Uh, this is important. You know, and, and, it, and that was it. It was a very quick conversation. Today, my 14-year-old daughter is the same thing happens. And my wife had, because she's 14, my wife is driving her to a 6 a.m. You know, private workout at the rink because mm -hmm. her brother did it. So it's like, uh, I mean, it's that, I, I could tell you right now, and I'm sure you could tell, I mean, to me, yeah. that, that generates more pride than any bonus I could ever earn ever again on Wall Street. That's right. And there's so many parallels between parenting and leadership, family and leadership. And it's funny, that's why... When I do coaching sessions, it usually starts off professional and it always veers into the personal. And always, right? You know, <laughs> always, right? Because what's going on at home impacts what's going on at work. And so I'll tell you, my son is 10 and we had a lot of behavioral challenges, challenges with him over the years. And something clicked about a year ago. And it was as I was becoming more crystallized in the leadership style that I coach CEOs in, in terms of trusting and giving autonomy, 
and I started rather than being, you know, overly controlling over the number of vegetables he eats or when he does <laughs> his homework, I started saying, look, here's the evidence. I would print him out from a, he'd stay up reading till 10 o'clock at night. And you don't want to bust your kid for reading, but you're trying to tell him you need to get a good night's sleep. And I print him out. Here's what the American Pediatrics Association says about how much sleep somebody your age needs. And I trust that you're going to make the right decision. And now he doesn't want to violate that trust. And so maybe when he's a teenager, all these parents of teenagers right now will be laughing at me at how naive that is. But it was really once I started trusting him, like I often coach CEOs to trust their C-suite and giving him more autonomy that he responded with, wow, I want to reward him. I don't want to violate that trust. I want to show loyalty to him. That's really cool, man. And he's still really young. I mean that that's a yeah. really that's a really uh, powerful testament to how how, you, how you've raised your raised your kids. Um, we only have a couple minutes left here, but um, you know when you when you look at the amount, let, let's put put this differently. When you look at the opportunity, like that you have here in terms of you know coaching, you're out there now. Finally, it's published. This has been a it's essentially your life's work, right? Uh, if you didn't have your life's experiences, you wouldn't have been able to create this type of work and and, and have the courage to set out on your own, like how, how big of an opportunity is it for everybody that's listening now? Like, I don't know if there's a scientific percentage, like we, you know, 61% of people don't know what their company's mission statement is. I don't know where you got that, but I'll trust uh, that I, he's a pretty good research analyst. I bet you that that's accurate. Um, <laughs> is there a percentage or how would you think about the opportunity in terms of scope, not just for you as a coach, because that's your yeah. business and your passion, uh, and it's great when your passion's your business, but, but what percentage of, 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 of people get up every day running businesses that just don't even talk about this or address it at all? That's right. I think it's an extremely high percentage. And I really? think that, yes, extremely high percentage. And I think that whether you run a massive organization or you're a first time manager and you have one person underneath you, virtually everything that I talk about in the book is going to be applicable to you. And I want to make sure before we leave that I open up about, I, I had um, anxiety for the first 40 some odd years of my life. And I was lucky that it was usually mild, but sometimes it was pretty tough. And I open up about it in chapter five, but I want to make sure people understand a couple things that, that really helped me get over it. And I think can, can help you if you have experienced that. And if you haven't to understand for your A players that may be experiencing that. And that is if you get up every single day and you approach what you do in a kind and honest and high integrity manner, and you attack your work with a meticulous process that's repeatable, that should significantly help you reduce the amount of anxiety that you have like it had with me because you've done everything in your control to do the right thing and maximize your odds of success. And that's the most important message I could give. Mm -hmm. Reducing, like you said, that was, a, that was a big number, like one out of two. I can even get to the, to, to the probability of that. Of CEOs, <laughs> that they're, they're real, I mean, this anxiety is something that few would, I, I actually, maybe, I guess I'm on the other half. I, 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 and, and that's why people, like I said, probably recommend that I get therapy. But the, because um, I don't, I generally just don't have anxiety. I think I've been punched in the face or hit, blocked too many shots, uh, pucks to the head and otherwise. I actually did take one right off the top of the head once where it split the top <laughs> of my head open. I mean, so maybe that's what happened. I don't know what causes that, but I don't have, like that's not an issue for me. Um, but you're saying it's, it's a, a real issue that a lot of people you know, may not be willing to admit, and they should, and they should find solutions for it. That's right. I, I would be willing to bet however big your senior leadership team is, maybe at least a third of them have experienced some level of mental health struggles, whether it's anxiety, depression, or, or things of that nature. And I think historically, our parents' generation, it was sweep it under the rug, right? Oh, yeah. you, you gotta look tough. But if you truly wanna be the best at your job, the best significant other and the best parent, then getting over that hump and allowing yourself to be vulnerable and seeking out a resource is so fundamentally important and one of the single best things you could possibly do in your life. Hmm. Well, with that, you know, uh, our time's up, but I actually 
have, I mean, I knew I was going to get a lot out of a real conversation with Ryan Renteria, to be clear. I didn't know where it was going to go, and I'm happy. That's, that's, for me, that's why I love these conversations, is, is that there's a, there's a curiosity and there's an adventure about it. Um, but the, the take, like uh, my, my company needs to, we need to establish some type of mental health resource that's at a much higher uh, and open-ended level for my teammates in case they're going through that. It's a great that's example, right. Ryan, where I just said, I don't, I'm just, for whatever reason, pucks to the head. I don't have a lot of anxiety. But my teammates do, some of them do, definitely. Uh, so let's create, uh, create an opportunity for them to find some solutions for that. So um, as always, thank you so much. You, you, you're, uh, you're, you're a bright light that came out of Wall Street, man. And uh, while I criticize Wall Street uh, plenty, I, the old wall fully loaded. You know, there are a lot of people that, that leave the old wall and go achieve and, and create you know, other and great things. And there are a lot of people on Wall Street that continue to achieve and, and create great things. So uh, thanks for having the courage to do that and for spending some time with me. Thank you so much, Keith. I really appreciate it. He's Ryan Renteria, so we've gone back to back here. If you make it three for three and then six for six, I'm impressed. We'll be right back.